Thank you, Virgiller. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to you, uh, Professor Maser, the, and also the Agnes, and we have here Tara and Aba. I'm thankful for this opportunity to given to me by uh, Professor Darren and the American University of Sovereign Nation to present my proposed study in relation to my PhD program in the university. I'm also fortunate that uh, you are with us here, Mam Tara and Mam Aba, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Agnes, the director of the research center of the University of San Jose Recoletos. So I'm interested to conduct a study on the concept, or I would say, what kind of framework of development that is appropriate for the indigenous peoples in Mindanao, given the peculiarity of their culture and experiences, as well as the indigenous philosophy and ethics, and also their indigenous epistemology. So to start with, I just, uh, this is my abstract. Uh, belonging of indigenous peoples to be, to be involved and consulted on any development programs and projects affecting their lives is like a tide that ebbs and flows throughout the history of marginalization and subjugation. The study aims to develop a development framework for indigenous peoples that is anchored on the indigenous uh, peoples' philosophy and epistemology and ethics. And in order to arrive to the depths of the indigenous peoples' dreams and experiences, I will use a three-pronged method of approach of qualitative inquiry. Thus, I will use a participant observation by going to selected communities, the indigenous peoples, and doing immersion and field work. I will also uh, conduct focus group discussion and key informant interviews with the selected participants. And I think the findings that I can derive from this study can be useful for the government, policy makers, development workers, businessmen, academic institutions, and other researchers from both government and public, private sectors to listen to the unheard uh, cry of the indigenous peoples and their enduring quest for identity and self-determination and consider them as the central components or indeed as partners, not just recipients in the development programs and projects. Uh, this is uh, a sample of the IP community. This is uh, from parts of Bukidnon and Agusan del Sur. Uh, as you can see, this is it's a, uh, a river. This, this river produces mineral and gold. That's why during flood uh, or after the flood, uh, Manobos and Banuaons flock into the river to get some, uh, some minerals uh, mixed with the sun and stones, and there are also a American there who is, uh, who is the one buying all these things. So it's indigenous mining skills, uh, mining uh, schemes, so. but this is now under threat because of the coming of multinational companies. This is part of that, that river, it's still a forested area. And uh, this is me, and this is uh, one of the sisters assigned to the community. Uh, it took us uh, three days to arrive to the place with eight to nine hours uh, walk. Uh, you have you have other options. You have to ride a horse, but uh, we don't ride. We don't we didn't ride a horse, so we, we walk and we arrive to the community. Uh, why I get interested in this study? This is now the background of my background of my study. My interest uh, to venture into the life life world and life system and value, value and belief system of indigenous peoples can be traced back in, in my childhood life, in my childhood experiences, uh, growing up in the hinterland of Dabo del Sur. Uh, it's natural for us, the hinterland of Dabo del Sur is uh, basically composed with the Bagubo Tagabawa, it's another tribal, uh, another, another tribe of indigenous peoples. Uh, we were playing with them and going to the river. And in fact, eight of us, we were eight in the family, siblings, were delivered by our mother through the help of that bailan, uh, the, the bagubot, the gabawa. We call that, uh, in our term, mananambal, or uh, a quack doctor. But she used to be the the obigaini, the pediatrician, the surgeon, and even the 
internist in the in the community. So I didn't experience to go into the hospital. He's the one curing uh, the, the the community. So. And when I studied college, this interest would soon be rekindled. Sorry, uh, kindled when my teacher in the social psychology class asked me to or asked us the class to immerse into depressed communities, and I and my companions uh, decided to to do immersion to the Blaan is a, in the far-flung communities of Matanao, Dabo del Sur. And through that experience, I was in awe with how the Blaans live their life and relate to, to the environment, especially to their God. The, 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 uh, their life is in, intimately interconnected with, with the environment. So I was in awe with that. And because of that experience, it's part of my routine to, to visit indigenous uh, people's community even when I was in college during important celebrations just like Christmas, New Year, and holidays. But this interest would soon transcend from mere appreciation of their culture, belief systems, and rituals towards advocating for the pro protection of their indigenous identities and distinct cultural practices from the onslaught of the lowlanders, outsiders, and colonizers encroaching into their territories, doing extractive business activities at the expense of their life and the very source of their life, the environment. This happened when I entered a Catholic order, namely the Religious Brothers of the Sacred Heart, whose mission is to provide hope for the poor and especially those at the margins of society. And we consider IPs as one of those sectors that are in the periphery, that are in the margins of the society. So in my formation years of the congregation, I was exposed to many different IP in, in indigenous people's issues, ranging from environmental degradation, displacement of indigenous peoples due to heavy militarization, and land grabbing, and human rights violations, among others. So as a result of these different formation activities, I became so resolved to do development and advocacy works with the indigenous peoples, especially in education, human rights issues, and many others. And I also visited many indigenous communities in Mindanao, lived, slept, and ate with them. I also brought my students to do immersion activities to different indigenous communities, bringing school supplies for the children and learning from them most of the time instead of us are teaching them. I even joined NGOs, national government, non-government organizations that have advocacy works towards IP and even accepted leadership roles to these uh, NGOs. So these are uh, these are some sample of the pictures uh, in my uh, advocacy work. I brought some of my students to, to be with these uh, kids. Uh, I help them in terms of really showcasing their uh, traditional way of cooking and preparing food cooking rice with the use of bamboo and uh, instead of plate that the plants they are, they are using as part of plate. This is their showcase when you are into the community and to be able to also to, to have their income. So I, I, I love it that at least they can, the, the audience or the guests can pay at least uh, 400 in a day including the, their stay to the community and part of that is the ritual and all these things. This is the school, there is a living tradition of that, that, that community. Another is a, this is a school of the Tagakaolo in Sarangani province. Uh, this is an adapted school. The, 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 the thing that I usually do is uh, the school supplies that the students will sample. I mean the student affairs and if there are students who cannot attend to meetings, all these things. So normally in school they have these functions during clearance, clearance signing. Instead of asking them uh, to sample some goods and before it was money, I, I neglected that money. I asked them to donate some school supplies to be given to these uh, uh, indigenous communities. So they're giving some uh, provisions and all these things. Uh, this is my field work to, to uh, Banwaon Tumili and Manobo in Agusan. Uh, I helped them in terms of preparing for the food. This is a hospital. Uh, I, I talked to Professor Daryl a while ago. This, there's a hospital in one uh, IP community in part, some part of Bukid, uh, 50 million worth hospital built by the religious of the Good Shepherd in 2004, but until this time it, it was not in operation because of suspicion from the military that this will be used 
as hospital for the leftist insurgents or the new people's army. Well, the new people's army are operating heavily in that area also. This is, this is the school that were uh, burned by the military. Uh, this is the way of travel uh, very far uh, in the area. I just see some pictures before I proceed. And this is also my experience. Uh, the, the lucrative business of lagging is very alive in the community, especially in that area. Then even this, uh, you know, the two enforcers are just getting money from the bribery and they did not check. These are Falcata. These are uh, trees that uh, the DIN are uh, allowed. But underneath this Falcata are the endemic trees. The Lawaan, so they cannot check because they just have to give. So I counted around 30,000 in one trip. And it took us three days to travel via the Agusan River to reach uh, Butuan City. Then I even encountered, I even penetrated to some, uh, of course I went to the NPA camps. Because in one of my interview with the Dato, it seems that they are so attached with the NPAs and I want to know why. So I, I, I also stayed with them for the three camps of the NPAs. Uh, it's another area, that's another area of indigenous community that I visited. And for us, for me, indigenous philosophy is anchored into the concept of land. Uh, that's, uh, later on, I will discuss uh, why why in terms of development, I think it has to be factored in the, their concept of land, their philosophy about land and land ownership. So, because uh, indigenous peoples have inseparable relationship with their land. This is a beautiful lake in Tibuli, South Cotabato, Lake Hulun. It is now under threat of, uh, again, another man, mine, cap, gold and copper mining companies are exploring in this area. And this is part of uh, Bukidnon, it's a river. Waterfalls in the area of Dabodul Sur are also under threat because of all these uh, development projects the, and coal, coal and hydroelectric uh, exploration for energy. <coughs> and in one of my engagement with the indigenous peoples, this is one of the, the, the I think, the, the forces that inspires me to really pursue in this in this study. One Dato shared to me that those who would like to help us must first immerse into our real situation as indigenous peoples before they will introduce any help so that they can really address our need. It's, that statement of that is like a sword that that peers into the interior core of my being as an outsider doing development works and providing goods to the community. It, it, it reminds me that the low of the is to be involved and consulted in any development programs and projects affecting their life is like a sound wave that reverberates through their rich uh, com and co but complicated socio-cultural and political as well as uh, spiritual landscape. It is like a tide that ebbs and flows throughout their long history of subjugation, oppression, and marginalization. Indeed, if I say, in the Philippines and even in the global scenario, the IPs have been subjugated by, by the powerful and dominant rationality and culture that encroaches into their uh, systems and life world. The subjugation of the IPs in the Philippines and in Mindanao can be traced back to the country's colonization. Uh, of course, before colonization, all the na Lumads or natives, we call that natives or IPs or Lumads, these are just three terms that are uh, synonym. In the, in the Philippines, all the, all the people in the Philippines were just lumads or natives. There was no classification, no gradation. When the Spaniards came and introduced a kind of concept of religion and Christianity, this is now the division comes in because those who embrace Christianity become Christians, and those who do not uh, remain to be IP, and those who embrace Christianity are called to be part of the elite and uh, the civilized and all these things. But but those who did not are the barbaric and the backward, etc. So when the Spaniards came, they introduced a kind of culture, that sort of division, that sort of dividing the people. Then aside from this, the, the most, I think, or the great impact of this colonization of the Spaniards 
to the Philippines is the introduction of the Regalian Doctrine. What is this Regalian Doctrine? A kind of decree that states that all of the land of the Philippines, including the pristine and forested lands, mostly occupied by the IPs, are owned by the King of Spain. That's the reason why you cannot, you cannot own this land because this is owned by the King of Spain. And it was exacerbated when the, when the Spaniards sold the Philippines to the Americans, to the United States of America, in the Treaty of Paris. When the Americans come in, I mean, uh, they introduce a kind of tolling system. This is a kind of titling of the land that you can obtain from the government. You buy this a piece of paper, and you have to show that, that you, own, you own the land. To the, to the extent that these IPs who are occupying these lands for how many years can be dispossessed from that, from that area because you are now the real owner by virtue of this title that you bought from the government. So a concrete result of this colonization is the commodification of land. For the first time in the history of the Philippines, land became a commodity that had a price in the market. So with the linking up of the florescent Philippine economic system to the world market and the cash economy, assimilation of the IPs into the colonial regime and the subsequent Philippine governments became inevitable. Thus, the rise of the monetary, banking, and exchange system as well as the initiation of the Philippines into feudal and ultimately the capitalist mode of production. Then, what happened to the indigenous peoples in Mindanao? Mindanao had seen the onslaught of the oppressive incursion into IP territories. Aside from the Spanish and American exploitation, there was also a parallel wave upon wave of migration of land-hungry uh, people from mainly from here, from this uh, island of Visayas, but, and also parts of Luzon, and, we, and go to the, went to Mindanao, because Mindanao is now the big, uh, Mindanao becomes the much heralded land of promise. The end of American occupation and the rise of the Philippine Republic further worsened what was already the disturbing phenomenon of the colonization of the life world of the IPs. So appropriating the Spanish Regalian doctrine and the Torin system, the subsequent government succession of the drafting of the constitution and the formulation of laws re related to land rights would have harrowing impact on the lives of the indigenous peoples and their communities as land became the site of intense contestations resulting into the eruption of violence leading to the loss of lives and homeland territories. The land laws passed during the Commonwealth times and the subsequent government were reinforced further in Congress, which had no record, which had no regard, I mean, for the indigenous people's rights to their ancestral domain. It was only in 1997 with the presidency of uh, Ramos that this April law or indigenous people's rights acts were passed and enacted into law. And the indigenous people's rights act mandate that the IP should be recognized in their ancestral domain. But this law is still very good in paper, but not in practice until this very moment. Uh, as a result of this development, forests have been wiped out because of logging corporation, and there, there were massive con construction of dams, uh, roads, and bridges to support the new development, and the livestock production to support the needs of the rich oligarchs and the multinational companies. Now, modernization and industrialization came unopposed. Modernization, industrialization, and globalization have been considered as threats. Threats to indigenous people's aspiration for self-determination. Now, because the concept of development is considered to be in strict economic terms, it was thought to follow an evolutionary process. For example, commence from basic commodity, then suppliers to capital accumulation, then industrialization leading to urbanization and modernization. Basically, following the model of Rostov's development that industrialization is the key to, to uh, modernization and the key to development. This dominant development paradigm which advertised so much the concept of modernization and industrialization as a rising tide that we left on boats have resulted to problems like destruction of the environment and the IP's political, economic, social and cultural practices, education and health, and indigenous knowledge system, as well as resulted to human rights violation. No wonder that there, despite many projects being implemented into indigenous communities, especially in Mindanao, the impoverished situations of the indigenous people still remain. 
ironically, instead of bringing development to these indigenous peoples and their communities, these programs and projects have encountered fierce resistance and criticism from the IP themselves because they think that these are not mid-based and inappropriate to their cultural, political, uh, value system, cultural practices and traditions. And this resulted to even human rights violation. So, example, in the Philippines, in the Cordilleras, Ilocosur, Mindanao, specifically this uh, place, Arakan Valley, Bukidnon, which are, uh, these are basically the local of my study now, except in Bukidnon, I will be focusing on Double Dilsur, this is uh, part of Double Dilsur. Most projects implemented by development partners, mostly coming from uh, multinational companies such as mining and, and, and palm oil and other uh, uh, banana plantation, have resulted to problems like environmental destruction. Look at this, uh, uh, Surigao is a uh, 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 sad reality now because of open pit mining. Uh, mountains were uh, made plain because of this mutilated uh, uh, mountains were mutilated forests were wiped out because of this development uh, they call this development they have roads they have dams they have uh, easy access to market and they call that development and some of this development because uh, ips are slowly resisting to this development resulted to militarization and uh, human rights violation Second impetus that uh, urges me to really conduct the study is when I interviewed another uh, tribal leader, he said, and he shared to me this one. We were living peacefully before because of our elders, because our elders were able to easily resolve our conflict using our traditional way of doing it, like our traditional Husai or amicable settlements, and some rituals to resolve conflicts like paying damages through pigs, horses, or chickens, depending on the gravity of the offense. Or that or the tribal chieftain, the, the head of the, the, the community, also helped in looking for means so that the offending party could really pay the damages to the persons or families being offended. But this time, there is this court already, and you have to hire lawyers, and they're so expensive. That's why some of us will just resort to Pangayo. Pangayo is their traditional justice system. They have to use that as the last resort whenever the offending party inflict injustice and it's a very uh, severe uh, injustice that we want to avenge the injustice so you have to use pangayo but it's the last resort but before had their datos given the authority in this time it could just be easily resolved because the dato the tribal chief they played a crucial role in that in that resolution uh, that is their uh, uh, clamor now that the datos are uh, they don't have any more authority because of the system, the political system in the Philippines. Now the authority in the in the place is the barangay captain. We call that the village chief. But before it was the tribal chief. So and this village chief, they are elected through election and they are really supported by uh, by politicians. So another impetus just happened recently. Uh, this one, by the way, happened in 2016. <coughs> the first one is in 2014. But <coughs> this one happened just last December. Thank you, um, I went to a school, bringing school supply to Blaan uh, uh, community last December. And I talked to the, to the students, high school students. Because this, this happened, this... Uh, I think it was in the local news in our locality because there was this riot between the the Bisaya or we call that Christian settlers, the non-IP and the IP students. The IP students are put in the mainstream because they want, you know, the the Philippine educational system really does not really recognize all these things, so it, have, it has to be put in the mainstream community. While there are some good in it, but in the other way, it's very difficult. So there was a riot. Because these Blaan students were being bullied, called many names, being bullied by the Bisaya. And these uh, Blaan students uh, grouped themselves to, to fight this Bisaya. So the riot was, uh, I think, uh, there was really injury. And the, the case was brought to a barangay captain, the village chief, who is a Bisaya. And according to the Blaan students, this were, these were the words of the barangay captain. 
Don't look for troubles in this place because my eyes have been watchful to you. Then he slap and kick our companions because for him we are the cause of troubles. I do not know why he has a strong disgust to us. And he really favored the Messiah or the, the non -IT. And he said, although the principal did not utter the meaning words to us, he is not also very supportive to us because we are just plants. So you know the, the discrimination and all these things. <coughs> For me, this is really uh, a case of a struggle of rec for recognition of indigenous peoples, recognition of their identity. That's the reason why I, I, I join NGOs to help them. So this is the NGO that uh, we have formulated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the vice president of this NGO. I help in trying to educate the, the in, in, even my students, uh, trying to educate wow. the, the, the IPs are good because we have these biases before. IPs are bad, barbaric, they, they put you into poison, all these things. These are biased from the mainstream society. But when you go to the IP community, they are the most, uh, I think, in my experience, they are most spiritual, most spiritual and most uh, kind person in, 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 the, in my experience. <coughs> One of their expression of struggle for recognition is they have to, they are asserting that the mining up of the Philippines will be uh, scrapped. This ha also happened recently in Surigao. 2017 and 2018. It was only that it was already in the time of the new president, President Duterte. Who, when President Duterte won, they have this high hope that uh, the president will really support them because when he was mayor in Dabao, he gathered all the indigenous peoples every December to really give them some uh, all these things, uh, provisions of goods, supply, etc. So they have high hope, but this time they have evacuated into their community because of this anti-insurgency campaign of the government. So they have evacuated, so it's a terrible situation. Uh, the, the clamor that it has to stop the killing of the Blaans. They, they have to assert indigenous people's right to self-determination. And this is a school, this is a school in the Malapatan, in Sarangani province, a school run by the NGOs, very nice students. But this school is, is, was born by the paramilitary and the military last uh, December 2017. This is, was also a school in Surigao, the Alta is very famous. I visited this place, I stayed there for three weeks, very famous, but uh, a very nice curriculum, agriculture, human rights, and you think that the, peop, the, the students or graduate here is tough in terms of what we call that in placement in the, in the ed, top notchers, but they're being sus, they're suspected and, and you know, by military and paramilitary that they are really forming NPAs, no? educating NPAs in the, in the area because uh, they are now asserting for their rights. And one of the leaders here were killed, three of them, three of them pala, were killed in front of the students. Uh, so, in front of the students. Uh, I know that the, the three of them, uh, they were my friends. They were killed in front of the students. So, it very, it's a sad reality and the operation of the school stopped for three weeks and now uh, luckily it resumed now. You know when you visit the school the monkeys are there so because they're in communion with, with they are really in communion with the environment. So it's so very nice they have agriculture, they have a so very nice uh, curriculum. Uh, really a uh, curriculum that is suited to the indigenous people's uh, dreams and aspirations but that's that's the reality. So for me it's really IPs have been subjugated, discriminated and marginalized because they have been misrecognized. They have been misrecognized. That's where <coughs> I think, as development worker, partly an anthropologist, although I really do not have formal training in anthropology, I'm now uh, studying masters in philosophy. And uh, but in terms of anthropological uh, backup, I really do not have training. It's just an experience. And as an IP rights advocate, I am interested to explore more on the narratives of. IPs experiencing injustices in the ground, experiencing subjugation and domination vis-a-vis -vis the coming of the different actors and agents of development in their communities. I will approach this study through the lens of development study, anthropology and philosophy as well as ethics, particularly the land ethics of the indigenous peoples. 
And from there, I'm hoping to be able to offer an alternative model of development that is anchored on the indigenous philosophy, ethics, and epistemology. As an IP rights advocate and student of philosophy, in this study, I will be doing a kind of critique to the notion of development advanced by the dominant agent using the narrative of the IPs in the ground and my experience working with them and listening to their stories as well as from the available literature. I would like to assert, of course, with the help of the theories that I, I, I would like to anchor my study here, uh, the one theory, the first development people and people first development theory of chambers and the Hunet uh, recognition theory and Habermas theory of communic communicative action. I would like to assert that those who are in the development field must listen to other people's stories and to pay attention to alternative points of views and new way of seeing and doing things and new approaching development. I hope to show as possible the interconnectedness of cultural, spiritual, and social aspects of the, the life of indigenous peoples and to go beyond what is from what is immediately apparent and to uncover as much as possible the complexity of social, economic, as well as spiritual and cultural life of the indigenous peoples in this time. When is there? My, of course, my, my different experiences and immersion to the indigenous peoples communities in Mindanao and the many stories and experiences of their subjugation, oppression, and domination from the colonizers, both from the inside and the outside, as well as some of their attempts to resist these forces of domination and subjugation, have ushered me into realizing that the failure of the dominant development paradigm to bring development to the indigenous peoples and their communities, as evidenced by the lingering economic crisis, environmental crisis, cultural disintegration and the illusion of biological diversity they have experienced provides a sign as well as a signal of the need to evolve of an alternative ways of focusing development thinking about development that is anchored in indigenous philosophy and epistemology it is in the light of the above mentioned consideration and concern that uh, i will pursue a study on developing a sustainable development model for the indigenous peoples in Mindanao that can address their lingering quest for identity. So these are uh, my research questions. Of course, the primordial intention of this study is to come up with a sustainable development framework or model that will cater to the development needs, longings, and aspirations of the indigenous peoples in Mindanao. And specifically, to be able to do that, uh, my question is, what are the current conditions? I, I would like to look into the current conditions or situations of indigenous people's development experiences in Mindanao. What are the institutions or social uh, act or the actors involved in their development situations? And what are the factors for them, sustainable and self-determined development? And at the last, I, I would like to discover what framework of development that is appropriate for indigenous people. Now, uh, let me go directly to my analytical and conceptual uh, framework of the study. <coughs> so in order to have a deeper grasp of the current situation or condition of the indigenous peoples in Mindanao, there is a need for me to go back to the IP community, to the IP community and to the recent past, and from there understand the current life world of the indigenous peoples and their experiences and realities and challenges as to their development. Thus, the first step of this study will be the, the discovery of the current conditions of indigenous peoples in the community. Then the next layer of analytical discovery will be the institutions, uh, government, national local institutions, and their in institutional capacities. The analysis of how the system of the government of the Philippines, both in the national and local, and their institutional capacities and practices that have impact uh, to uh, indigenous people's uh, life and the indigenous people's community. And the last layer will be the enabling environment. Uh, for me, this is the, the third layer of the study will be to find out some international laws and policies that impact the life world of the indigenous peoples in Mindanao. 
because for me it is anchored on the premise that as the Philippine government espouses a foreign-oriented economic system and open its economy into international trade, more aggressive campaigns to expand the businesses of the foreign investors, mostly multinational mining companies and industries, into the indigenous territories were done, which resulted into more colonization of the already colonized indigenous communities. So from this contemporary life world diapies, uh, I gather data, for example, in, in their experiences and the factors and those who are involved in their experiences and to be able from that data, then I will, uh, through them and through their experience, to be, uh, I'm hoping that I can make a framework for sustainable development for indigenous peoples. <coughs> now, let me proceed with my theoretical framework. <coughs> that will help me. Uh, the first uh, theory that uh, I think would be very helpful in this study is the participatory and people first development of rubber chambers. According to the strongest advocate of participatory development, dominant development paradigm is characterized by biases which are disempowering. These biases include Eurocentrism, positivism, and top-downism. The overarching tendency is to equate development with modernity and industrialization as achieved by Western societies. Hence, development for them means copying of these advanced countries through rational planning by experts and technocrats and the role of the people will just be the objects of this grandiose and national schemes. So what the local people are put into the sideline, they are just recipients and a part of the process. But for participatory development in this study, this assume, that's my hypothesis, that putting the people first in the development equation and model was the only way to achieve sustainable and self-determined development for the indigenous peoples in Mindanao. This assumption is rooted in the studies of many academicians, mostly Robert Chambers, who argued that for development to be sustainable and self-determined, the local people must be placed at the center of the development equation as they are the important actors in their own development. The next uh, theory that I will uh, put Anchor is the theory of communicative action by Georgian Habermas. Uh, Georgian Habermas, in his theory, presents a model of communicative rationality, which is opposed to a non-communicative and goal-oriented nationality. In this study, I would like to explore the different validity claims of these uh, indigenous peoples about their experiences, narrative of their injustices and experiences, which are, for me, valid claims especially in their desire to change and desire for self-determination. Uh, what characterizes communicative rationality is the activity of reflecting upon our background assumption about the world that brings our basic norm forward for questioning and negotiating. Because Habermas would like to, in his list of ethics, would like to welcome other options, other, other views. Uh, we, we need to discourse, we need to discuss. So in the context of the experiences of the IPs, Habermas contends that there are systematic distortion in communicative processes owing to the tendency of the modern societies for one-sided rationalization thus he introduces the concept of life for and system which I will also explore in this study. And the last is uh, theory is the Huneth struggle for recognition. Uh, Axel Huneth in his theory of struggle of re for recognition advances the notion that aside from equal economic distribution of equal opportunities and distribution of equal opportunities that John Rawls and Fraser's advance to be able to really achieve this kind of justice and balance in terms of development for Hunet uh, it is basically recognition of a person's unique identity as an important component in the area of social justice and development basically Hunet is drawing heavily from the psychology of myth personal and um, the uh, they call that individual experience and the politics of right of Hegel who theorizes that the struggle for recognition is about self-esteem and self-realization and this cannot be realized if the individual cannot experience a sense of recognition in the three spheres of his uh, life in the individual sphere where love and reciprocity must be experienced 
in the legal sphere where there is that equal legal equal protection of the law and in the social sphere within there must be a, a kind of recognition of the important contributions of the, the indigenous people especially in, in their indigenous skills knowledge and practices so my method In pursuing this study, I will utilize a qualitative research design anchored on the ethnographic tradition. Uh, qualitative research is a system of inquiry which seeks to build a holistic, largely narrative description of, to inform the researchers' understanding of the social and cultural phenomenon. Qualitative research takes place in a natural setting, employing a combination of observation, interviews, and documentation or document reviews. So specifically, I will use ethnography and phenomenology as my plenary approaches or strategies. Thus, I will employ field work, I will visit uh, communities and immerse myself to different uh, indigenous communities that do, the local of my study in order to observe the actual situations of the communities and people and uh, the phenomena being studied. I will also employ applied qualitative research techniques to discover persons, prog programs, events, process, institutions, civil society, social group, or phenomenon in being investigated within the specified time frame using a combination of appropriate data co uh, collection devices. So aside from field work and immersion, I will also do participatory research or participatory observation. I've been doing this, uh, participating in the ritual, in the communities, but I will uh, really intensify all this uh, uh, strategy to make research look for meaning in the constructive experience of the participants. The interpretation derived from the collaboration of the researcher and the participants, the unit of analysis comprises of group, organization, or individuals, and the outcome is the resolution of an existing problem. So furthermore, I will also do focus group discussions with the selected participants coming from the tribal chieftains who were mostly in handling important leadership role in the community. Uh, their people's organization, uh, other participants uh, might be from the women and youth, and also from the bylands, bylands their, their, their uh, healer and their walian or their priest, because they have this uh, actually indigenous peoples, even before Plato uh, discussed that this is this uh, structure in the society, this the philosopher king, the, the warriors and the guardians, indigenous peoples have already their system. They have their priest, they have their walia, they have their healer, all these things. So, but this has been destroyed by the by modernity. Last but not the least, I will also employ key informant interviews with the selected tribal chieftain and, and Bahanis. Bahanis is the warriors, the region Pangayaw. Yeah. And those who belong to the warrior clans, and those who occupied significant position in the provincial and local government, representative from the local government units, church missionaries who are doing a lot already in the community, non-government organization and people's organization. So for my data analysis, since qualitative research is multi-method of approach as well as in practice, I will also use a variety of theories and approaches to analyze the data that I will gather using the different methods and approaches. Data gathered through observation and immersion will systematically analyze using the thematic analysis of Kulaisi, which was uh, improvised by Anderson and Spencer. Then responses from the key important themes that emerge in the distillation process of the data through the use of thematic analysis will be called out and gathered for the next layer of analysis and more in-depth analysis using interpretive phenomenological analysis and thematic analysis, thematic analytic review to answer the research objectives. So in reading the data to answer the research problem, number one, on the current conditions and situations of the IP, I will analyze the responses of the participants of the triggered questions being asked of them using interpretive phenomenological analysis. This approach of analysis tries to understand the experiences and conditions of the individuals and how they make sense of them and what meanings those experiences. Basically, Hidigirian and Hosegan approach that how the participants make sense of their experience. They're just relating, but how they interpret their own experience. So, interpretive phenomenological analysis is concerned with trying to understand lived experiences and how participants themselves make sense of their experience. So, in addition, responses of the participants will be grouped into matrix, matrix form, because there will be 
that's why I shared uh, a while ago a bit ambitious because there will be four tribes and even if they are collectively called indigenous peoples they have still peculiarity in each tribe so that's why I will be doing comparative also comparative analysis as to their philosophy their land their their structure so it's a bit uh, it's a bit complicated but uh, I would like to explore on this area because so far in my limited also I'm not saying that I exhausted all the literature but none so far I, I, I encountered that they have really embraced uh, some of the, some many of the studies are homogeneous in nature studied only the Blaan, studied only the Manobo, studied only this one but no study really incorporating the, the four so, or the three so I would like to, to venture on this so important themes gathered during the treatment data and research objective or problem number one research objective problem number this is inter inter interrelated so then we'll use frame analysis and to be able to answer research problem or objective number three i will employ framework analysis developed by researcher at the uk national center for social research approach develop a, or use a hierarchical thematic framework that is used to classify and organize data according to the key themes concepts and emerging categories the framework identifies a series of main themes subdivided by succession related subtopics once judged to be comprehensive its main theme is charted by completing a matrix or table where each case has its own row and columns that represent subtopics so i'll be really doing matrix and analysis part of the comparative analysis so the last in terms of ethical considerations uh, since the integrity and reliability and validity of research findings are heavily are rely heavily on hadrianist the ethical principles, the handling of these ethical issues greatly impact the integrity of the research project. To ensure the welfare of the participants of my study, I will make use to follow the following ethical considerations. So, number one is the informed consent. Uh, informed consent is an essential part of all research and divorce that in, involve human participants. The human rights of research participants must be protected. It is it is incumbent upon the qualitative researcher or any researcher to provide a dynamic informed consent where when study outcomes change. So the violation of privacy is more apt to occur with a, with in-depth interviews and even uh, subjugation and dominant interviews can might might occur during interviews is one of the ethical uh, issues. This has implication for researchers to protect human rights throughout data collection, analysis, and dissemination. So in this study, I will obtain free, prior, and informed consent from the each participant using an approved informed consent form uh, that uh, has been approved by the international or to be approved by the International Review Board of the American University of Sovereign Nations. I will also ask permission to conduct the study from the National Commission for Indigenous Peoples and to visit different IP communities. I will also provide information sheets to all my participants and explain to them the nature, purpose, risk, benefits of the study and I will obtain their willingness to be part of my study through their signature of the information sheet and consent. Then, when all these are done, it's the time I will uh, conduct, I will uh, conduct formally the study. In terms of privacy and confidentiality, I will make use to protect the identity and privacy of my participants and confidentiality of the information. We, they, they might share really a very crucial information here in terms especially the, the conflict in the community as to the coming of these mining companies are evident. The polarization of the indigenous peoples are there. Those who are supporting and those who are anti, so they are also killing each other. So this is a uh, crucial study, so I will be protecting their identity and confidentiality, so pseudonyms and all these things. So my role as a researcher in this study, I will act as a friend, an interviewer, transcriber, and data analyst and interpreter. During the course of my study, I will be ready to act as listener and counselor to some of my participants. Despite my, dif my different role as researcher, I will ensure that this study will be trustworthy by adhering to the trustworthiness of qualitative research uh, advanced by Lincoln and Goba in 2009, which are the following credibility, dependability, confirmability, and transferability. I can say that uh, my study will be credible, dependable, confirmable, and trust because I follow the guidelines, I will follow the guidelines, and in addition, I have also the audacity to really 
claim all these things because I have been uh, doing uh, since uh, 2000 until now doing development works to indigenous peoples in the United States. Thus, I'm sure that they will have trust in me to rebuild their unheard stories and experiences. That could be all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, quite ambitious program and then also quite detailed in the framework. <coughs> I'd like to open for questions and welcome, Brindle. I'm not going to ask Agnes, Brindle. Uh, okay. Would you like to introduce yourself, Brindle? Uh, I'm Gwen from this uh, university. I'm sorry I was late because I still have some students to attend to. And uh, I was in the middle of uh, me and I could sense that you, your mind is so pregnant with ideas about this particular study. And I just see the kind of work that you will have. So how many months could you do the research or years? Because you have integrated <laughs> yeah, yeah. almost yeah. all kinds of <coughs> studies. <coughs> So very broad. Yeah, I think it's really more it's than so a broad. year. Uh, it will take me uh, a year or uh, two. But could there be a possibility that you can somewhat uh, bring us to a certain, like for example, are you, are you, is the Bang Samoro thing a kind of identity, um, identity measure for the people in the particular place that you would like to study? Yeah, it could also be uh, because uh, the Bang Samoro is very very much anchored on their claim for recognition. Yeah. So, it could also be so... And now, there's a problem with this BBL or Bang BOL, Bang Samoro Organic Law, because indigenous peoples were not part of the equation. They are also claiming because they are in the Bang Samoro area. There are also some indigenous people. So, it could also be uh, part of the model how they use into that. So. Um. My only concern is, um, as you were presenting, I was so amazed by all the knowledge that you have about these indigenous peoples in your in your place. Are you from Indonesia, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. So my only concern is, give us a can you can you somewhat delimit it to some areas in which you can have a better picture of the indigenous people that you really want to to study. And then, uh, because there are so many things that you would like, because I know that your heart is full of so many things that you would like to be done in this particular time. But the thing is, if I were not your, if I were not a Mindanawanon, and I wouldn't know all this, so how can you give me a picture being a person who comes from another place to give me a picture of the indigenous people of Mindanao. So, the limitation. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, it's also, I discussed with the uh, person already this morning. Yeah. Uh, whether to really focus on the uh, one tribe and really focus yeah. on this because basically homogeneous is also important in qualitative research or to make another tribe, at least two, to have a comparison. but. Uh, Although, as I said, they are collectively called IPs, but they have peculiarity in their culture, even their concept of land, their ethics, they have also peculiarity. So, uh, uh, <coughs> I guess, uh, yeah, it's very valid. I consider that, that that's the reason why with this uh, forum now, I can be properly guided also as to really... Yeah. I really salute for you, sir. So, mm. I really appreciate mm. the, the, the knowledge that you have. And then, uh, by the way, you, you set your questions, I think they're so big yeah. for me who do not know more about Mindanao, although I am a Filipino, and I understand that they're always in chaos, and these indigenous people are quarreling with some, uh, some sectors there, and so on and so forth. So I just see also the chaos there in your study. So give us a peaceful one in which we can be guided into this they see that we could also appreciate their cultural differences like their beliefs and so on and so forth especially the identity like these people here who from Mindanao they come to Cebu and then they they go on the streets to ask for arms mm -hmm. 
And then uh, he said, oh, you better go home and then you wash clothes and then do this. There are so many jobs for you. So I think they also belong to the indigenous people from, from Mindanao. So uh, that's the only thing I want to see in your study, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So when it comes to, ano, sir, so it's graphic. No, Thank it's you, ma'am, for your heart, that, uh, your mind. Yeah. Good to be really And even the emotions, sir, I can see. <laughs> but I see, I see why you want to be so comprehensive, so holistic. Because it's hard to separate all these things. In fact, it's impossible. Yet, I, I hear what you're saying, ma'am. If you really want to reach people and explain the situation and make an impact, you might, I think you're going to have to sacrifice that breath to go deep and keep it simple. It's a, but it's almost like you have a second project waiting. Mm -hmm. They're almost like two different projects, like especially with the four groups. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about, you don't want to lump them together. You want to celebrate and uh, see their differences, and, and, and that's a whole nother. But I think that might be a different um, output eventually, something to work on in the future. It's, it's not that it's not important. It's just it could be too much for some audiences. I understand the, the concern really because uh, yes, I, I, I said a while ago I have I have conduct, conducted studies because of this and this uh, and now for uh, I think it's grandiose and uh, very ambitious for uh, this thing, I would like to love this but that's why I talk to Fulfill that you can I think the panel can also help me uh, yes. trim down all these uh, grandiose ideas that I would like to I would like to propose because uh, you know, I'm bad, very uh, passionate. passionate about it, yeah, but uh, I, I can also be uh, being with your, with your guidance. I can also okay, focus on this uh, one at a time, maybe later. What if you chose two tribes? Two tribes. And it would maybe um, it could be it possible. Would get the best of both worlds. You can do yeah. the comparison. You can show that they're not all the same, and that because that's an important element, and it might be manageable. It could. Uh, it's a piece of very feasible now because in one province the, the two tribes are present so I will be only focusing on one, one province, province. because like, I will, I will yes. be to Kobato is very uh, yeah and do they work together sometimes do they come yes they crystal sometimes so yes. during gathering so that could be also yeah, a, a great they have those, element so, and <coughs> so I, I, I'm thankful for that uh, concept of delimitation because I will be focusing on one province only. Okay, and also you can have their beliefs, culture, and blah, blah, blah. Yes. So you can focus on uh, identity. Uh, you have to be uh, concerned only a few of their, you know, uh, attributes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have one suggestion, and that is, I guess you have to put a matrix, in a matrix form, your objective, then with that objective, what is your methodology, and then your instrument. Because it is in this way wherein we can really make sure that the objectives are aligned with your, uh, with the title of your study. Because it's, uh, main, the main thing is, if you want to capture identity, which among those objectives of yours that will capture your title. Secondly, with regards to, let's say, developing a, an SD model, which among those objectives of yours wherein you can generate that kind of model because unless you have proven us the different objectives of yours that will capture your title then that's the thing that we can uh, work on so because we i have seen you have lots of things to work and then you have mixture of uh, no methodology as well you have the comparative you have the what they call this qualitative um, qualitative inquiry so in this way, by having the matrix form, I guess you will be more guided and we will see that indeed your objectives are aligned to your title. Thank you, thank you. Okay. And, and before, uh, <laughs> I, I just really joined it to what Mom uh, earlier said, yeah, Mom Robin mentioned, that it's easy to identify even if you're going to to have all those four because I know you are you, you know them already you have started immersing yourself into into them no you have you have known them for years maybe it's possible that you can really work on all of them however if you follow the the suggestion of Mom Ruby, that would be that would make things easier for you to to be able to identify work, what identify you really want. and because it's possible that you can do it considering that uh, you have 
already the experience working with them and immersing yourself with the tribal Filipinos. And that way, uh, from from the total, like, what are the commonalities of all these uh, tribes? Yeah, so it's easy to see as, as a whole, but later on you can, you can have a more focused study on each of them. And I love the matrix. Uh, I'm visualizing the X and Y, and if you want to compare and contrast the, the cultural aspects or the connections with nature and show the similarities and differences, but it also um, enables a structured and a manageable way to, to dis discuss all the challenges that they're facing, because that also seemed to be so much. You have environmental degradation. You have bri bribery and, and monetary issues. You have min uh, you have environment. Uh, excuse me, companies moving in, and you have the army. I mean, this is four completely separate yet also completely related issues. And to keep to hold it all in your head and like keep track. I think a matrix is a great idea. And if you're using the the different names, you can see. I can just kind of picture the access as a as a reader would really help me to keep organized and as a you know as, as somebody wants to show the information you can present it very clearly for example if all four tribes have the same views yes. when it comes to these issues what a strong case now they're not exactly the same in the other ways but hypothetically of course are, are all of those tribes uh, affected by these particular issues. So it's easy, it will be easy for you to see and, and be able to identify. Okay, one more thing, the last I think. So based on your title, you have there towards developing SD model. So you have to ensure that one of your objectives, perhaps the last objective of yours, will really capture that title because it's very hard to make a developing an SD model uh, with a kind of nature uh, you are capturing Mindanao so you have to ensure that you are really uh, they call this claiming what what should be and the last one is it should be addressed uh, with a literature gap so that's why you have this SD model of yours developing an SD model because of the literature gap and with the findings of your study so unless you give us that justification, you can never use this as your title. In our university, we cannot uh, make immediately outright the title without first looking at the main objectives where we derive the results of the study. Although you can, you can uh, revise the title later mm -hmm. on based on the on results the of your study yeah. because uh, from the objectives, you will be able to have the findings, and from the findings, you can come up with a yeah. with a final title mm -hmm. if that is what you really want. Like uh, we know that you are very passionate about those four, then maybe you can still pr pursue for as long as you you follow the, the, the suggestion. Okay, it's it's really something that people can see when like at one glance, you will already be able to see that the differences, the commonalities, and the, the, the challenges that are affecting each of the tribes. But it's also good, uh, the, the consideration of mom, uh, the, the, if I can just two. Yeah. Of course, in my, in my... You can limit it to Yeah, for my yeah. course, in terms of practicality, I will be doing only in one province. In one province and it's yes. pro you know, province in Mindanao is quite... Uh, Big, you need to really travel, and yeah, but in four provinces, it's a quite also. You'll have to be in good shape, you know. That's a lot of yeah, money. In, because oh. in one province, uh, there is that uh, do, dominant really yeah. the dominant ah, okay. tribe. So, 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 so I can do that, but following, with, that. following yeah. with the suggestion. That's so I you. am about to ask you whether mm. you're teaching. You can see that, mm. as you mentioned, you are you part mm. of five mm. duties rolled into one mm. uh, researcher, interpreter, in court, whatever you <laughs> mentioned, and then. You also made mention of the international, yeah, you're looking at this particular study in the lens of this uh, uh, international standards. So that could be another study maybe, sir. Yes. So do not uh, include that one anymore. So that could be a very good suggestion for another study. Okay. Can be part of your recommendation. Yeah, oh, part of the recommendation. Yeah. So, so you have already so for getting more recommendations. Yeah. Staying in the national. Yeah. Don't involve international yet. 
what has Was that the suggestion? But uh, I think I cannot, I cannot also get away from international because these multinational companies are coming in exactly. this article. Well, international uh, development. Depends on yeah. the country. Oh, okay. So maybe part of the literature. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the literature. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not to mention the theoretical background, I think you're going to find a lot of uh, reflected cases in the past, such as the Yanomami, Yanomami tribes mm -hmm. in, in the Amazon, mm -hmm. and the kind of research you're looking at is. Is, is, is mirrored in, in past studies, and it, it's, it can't help but be international. And the, and the non, the NGOs and the nonprofits involved in stepping up and helping in these cases. In fact, I want to I want to interject. These are such uh, touchy subjects. Do you have a lawyer on hand? <laughs> you might think when you start getting into this, yeah. you're touching some pretty explosive issues, yes, and you yes, might uh, want to make some friends in high places. Oh, you have. Uh, <laughs> Plenty of your friends, <laughs> just but uh, you know, you know, I I I appreciate really the the comments uh, so that I, as I said, I can be guided because uh, of course I, I'm happy with that with the comment that it has to be limited and all these things. So of course, for other purposes, uh, for for more focus. So yeah. th thank you, thank you for the, the comments. Yes, sir. <coughs> Yeah, thank you for the comments. It's interesting. I'll give you some reflections. Uh, firstly, I don't think you need a lawyer. You need a you need body armor. Body card. <laughs> body armor and bodyguard. Yeah. Check your car every time you drive. Um, that's one thing. So the title reminding us, the title is Enduring Quest for Identity Towards a Sustainable Development Model for the Indigenous Peoples in Mindanao. How many recognized indigenous peoples are there in Mindanao now? <coughs> uh, I think more than 10 with Manobo, Bagobo, Blaan, Talaandi, Tagakolo, Kalagan, Tiduray, Manua, Kamayo. So <laughs> more than 10 <laughs> indigenous uh, tribes. Okay. And do they uh, fall into clusters of similar groups? Yes, uh, actually, this uh, this uh, Banwaon and Talaandi and Igaon are really have the Manubu roots. They are coming from the Manubu roots. So, basically, the, the, the dominant one in terms of Manubu, Blaan, and Tagakaulo, these are the dominant uh, indigenous tribes. From the publications of the National Research Council of the Philippines, there have been studies done on the Mamanwas, studies done on Bagobos, on the Manobo. So these are studies that you can start with because like these are related studies that you can work on to be able to find out more about them and include it in as part of your study in related studies. In our CP. Yeah, in RCP. They have they have publications and you can search it in the yeah. website. Yes, so there are several ways of considering a number of tribes. I still think it's uh, it's suitably ambitious to look at all ten twelve tribes. But you could choose to first do an in-depth study of one tribe and then you develop a model or you tribe. challenge a model and then you uh, have your matrix or your way of describing the model and then you're able to more quickly survey other tribes and see if they are consistent with the model and if they're consistent with the model then it provides uh, recommendations for further detailed research if necessary uh, on tribes 2 and 7 of the 11 tribes uh, saying these might be counter to the model but from a preliminary analysis the model developed in detail with this tribe works. And you can always of course test the model. The question is would you want to test the model in detail on one tribe first and test in detail on a second, or do the uh, matrix or you know, initial survey of the other ten tribes to be comprehensive and representative? 
So there are different ways of getting looking at data. One of the ways is if we compare to an earlier model of uh, data analysis mm -hmm. called KJ card method is to illustrate the diversity of the ideas rather than not to quantitate how many have it but just to see the diversity. So that can that sort of approach can be done quickly. But for the development of a indigenous development theory that is applicable to as a description of what happens in Mindanao currently, you probably need to have uh, at least some metrics and say the following 15 criteria of your model, which ones are found with which tribe. So that's, that's a one way. But uh, if uh, the first I'm, step I'm sorry if uh, if I get, get you right, uh, one of the suggestions, well, the, not really suggestion, but the options, if I can develop an in-depth study in one tribe and create Some a model, model. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's that's another study. It's like one study. No, well, that's no, that's one part of the study. One part of the study, and, 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 and test the other. If it takes study. five years, and then will be the end of your study yeah. <laughs> for the PhD, and the rest will be yeah. other PhDs. Mm -hmm. But the uh, let's say it takes you one year to do an in-depth study of one tribe. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable. That's, that's, and then yeah. you do the uh, testing of the model. You test the model. Mm -hmm. Uh, for another year in the other ten tribes, so you have two years, ten years. Uh, to two. <laughs> research to do, which is reasonable for a PhD and then some time to write it up. So that's, I think, a reasonable... Uh, of course, it's very ambitious, but you can, you're capable to do it. We have been raised in the introduction the questions why with all the interest in development studies in the Philippines, why is there not an existing model mm. that's based on a bottom-up indigenous people's approach? Uh, and in our discussions, you indicated you haven't found such a suitable model yet from a bottom-up approach. Yeah. But there are many scholars who use, and you also quoted a few Western ideologies that are these applicable. Another question in terms of describing indigenous wisdom is why do we attribute indigenous wisdom ideas to some modern scholar who mm -hmm. studied them 10 years ago and wrote a paper? Because the indigenous philosophy is uh, for several millennia it's developed. And it may be that, unfortunately, many researchers are too engrossed in their own theory or Western conceptual framework that we've been educated in to start from the bottom up. And so that's the, uh, I think, important aspect here, that you do a bottom up study. Now, of course, you may find, given that there are quite a few scholars in the Philippines, there may be some people that you know or have worked who have been looking at this. They may not be in universities. There might be some missionaries. There might be some medical doctors or outposts that have been taking, keeping notes. So um, describing these alter alternative sources to the mainstream academic literature is important. Um, so I don't think and about the ambition in the title, uh, personally I don't mind an ambitious title, it's fine. Um, of course the final thesis is where you might have to show it, but the proposal is good. It's, uh, the title is ambitious, and uh, if you want to change your world, see if you can do it in two years. If you can, then that's good, but most likely you cannot, but uh, it's okay. Can I just, yes, just piggyback can. really quickly? Um, yeah, do I, I, this is my first uh, witnessing of an oral defense proposal. And after the um, good fortune I had the honor to speak at the research congress today, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I hope you can share this video with students and see what is possible. I mean, it's not perfect, but what a, a great exchange of ideas. And you're passionate, and 
anyway, so I'm inspired. Um, and I want to just commend you. You brought up, um, you said the words explore their experience. I think that's bottom up. You uh, mentioned women and youth. I commend you for mentioning them. And it was so interesting. I, I had written down uh, phenomenology right before you said that. So I am really impressed that you are incorporating that. And I encourage just a suggestion. Uh, if you know much about phenomen phenomenological ecology, that's a mouthful. Um, I'm happy to send you some information. I, I'm reading a book about it right now, and it's precisely what um, you, sir, you're talking about, um, using these millennial-old constructs instead of these recent Western uh, ways of, of viewing things. And I think that's exactly what the world needs um, to see that. Um, so, yeah, I, but I, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I came. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to also receive the book so I can, I can especially I'm old environment, so I'm mm -hmm. a big Now, also in terms of the analytical framework, I think we need to open up a little bit because let's imagine that we have, let's imagine that we the bounce. Uh, we can imagine that we have the question for the what is development, how do we measure it? Yeah. Uh, is it by economic development, political right. representation development? Is it by the development of music, or dance, or art, <laughs> or uh, nutritional sustainability? for access to clean drinking water. So there are many indicators of development. Yeah. This is part of your matrix. You could also you know, ask for the, the tribal members. You have the 25 measures of the Human Development Index and other development yeah. indexes. Uh, how would you rate these on a scale? You know, how often do you think about it each week, or how often do you think about it each month, and then get, get an idea, uh, a way to measure this. So then it takes the Human Development Index framework model or these other models of development, and then takes it onto the framework for each uh, tribe each tribal member. And then of course you compare the generations, young people, old people, people of exposure to uh, working in the mine, those who entered into the commercial economy to get paid for uh, timber illegal logging or uh, boats or whatever. These may have different ideas of development too. So, it, you know, it's yeah, so I think that you know, there's, these are some of the frameworks. So the analytical framework is good to have it, but it's actually just a place where you could you could think of different ways to analyze. So that's why I put it up uh, there for you. And I think um, the research questions. Uh, I would add in uh, tribal measures of what is development. So how to define development, what is development. Yes. Um, because that's a key question, what is development. Um, so who, def you know, so if, because you're trying again in your thesis to measure a developmental, develop a developmental theory, so that's a very fundamental, it's even one chapter of the thesis is What's the concepts of development in this tribe? Yes. That's a central question. I also have one question, like how do you define, or how do you consider uh, a tribe in Mindanao to be indigenous? I, is there a standard for, for them? Or, yes sir? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's already established a standard, actually there are already anthropological studies and it's the standard by, by the anthropology. Uh, anthropologists in Ateneo and some other anthropologists in the Philippines. They have this, uh, they, that's why they classify this, they are indigenous. Uh, indigenous in the, in the sense, because there are three, no, in the Mindanao, the, the Muslim Christian settlers and indigenous. 
indigenous peoples are those uh, really practicing the, the really indigenous. Uh, so if, uh, if you are going to to define this in your in your definition in one or two sentences, how would you define it? Indigenous peoples are uh, those belonging to tribes that uh, practice their distinct identity, uh, separate from Christians and Muslims. Okay. There are tribes which are not considered indigenous. Or have yeah, identified yeah. as indigenous. Yeah, so they are, they are already, they're already. But they are still there. Yeah, they are already some some show into the mainstream, uh, ah, okay. uh, mainstream the culture. Yeah, 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 culture. It's a rather an insult to hmm. an indigenous person so. uh, to yeah. say that, okay, just because I decided to come to Manila hmm. and hmm. drive a car or be a university professor, hmm. yeah. uh, I'm no longer indigenous? indigenous. Yeah. Well, incorrect. They're indigenous if they self-identify identity hmm. as indigenous, no matter what their lifestyle choice is. And many indigenous people might own casinos or they might own mines. Yeah. And they still might be really the uh, what the condition yeah. is really belonging to a tribe classified as the yeah. indigenous uh, tribes. Is there a blood quorum? For example, you have to be one sixteenth member of the tribe or one quarter blood? Because this Yeah, because we'll be with the intermarriage uh, phenomenon. Uh, the NCAP have this uh, concept that uh, at least you have a 50 percent. What? 50 percent in terms of, for example, 50 percent member of uh, the, the blood component. Yeah. Yeah. For example, your your father is a pure blooded uh, IP, and your mother is a Bisaya. You are still considered indigenous because of the 50 percent. It's the it's very strict. Yeah, it's very, very strict. strict. In New Zealand, it's one sixteenth, one thirty-two. I think so. In, in North, America. North America, one fourth. But mm -hmm. some tribes, mm -hmm. Cherokee, mm -hmm. any amount as long as you identify. Mm -hmm. So it's it's mm -hmm. okay. But, it, this but the planning for the really the full-blooded, the the I don't know if uh, I need your comment for the interviews. A no, it doesn't need to be full-blooded full because. Let's say you happen to be uh, raped by a Spanish conquistador many years ago. You're no longer full blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, you are. You are. It's very difficult to identify. How would you know, sir? Yeah, full blooded. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so it's, no, it's a yeah. member of the tribe. Member yeah. of the tribe, okay. Mm. And, uh, so, for example, if uh, some body from overseas comes to the Philippines and marries an indigenous person and joins a tribe, she is now indigenous, <laughs> you know, if she identifies as indigenous, but in many, however, if you define by blood, they would not be, but it, in many tribal, traditional tribal systems, they could become adopted as a tribal member. Well, one good thing in the community is really the, the tribal shifting or the dato, we really identify, yeah, that's, that's our member, yeah, they will, they will, uh, say. They will recognize and they will acknowledge that he is really a member of our tribe. Are there any questions on Skype, please? Question on Skype. Do you have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? If you remain to have that mm -hmm. uh, all in all in mind, I suggest you need to have a software. What about the uh, Because book? looking, yeah. I have the MDB book uh, Max Kiddy. Because, um, Studies like that are very noble and it needs to verify for it to be published. It needs software in order to justify that the findings of yours is not biased because nowadays if we have qualitative studies, the publications, the editor-in-chief will really ask what software did you use to justify that indeed the findings of yours are not biased. Oh, yeah, I understand in the software, but the Invivo is still you're the ones uh, really As coding. As I know, Invivo, yeah. there are still other. I have, also, other I have also the Max QDA, but the Max QDA is just detailing all this, uh, all the train, and still the person mm -hmm. doing the analysis is not really the, the, the software, but, but really the, the process. process. Yeah. The process, they, they, are don't, want to check. For the they process. don't want to check the math. <laughs> yeah.
Anyway, it's a good suggestion also. But uh, any questions in Skype? I think everyone's satisfied by the sound of it. Yeah. Any other comments, suggestions? Just thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're looking forward to, from the period of the proposal to the thesis, we like people yes. to finish quite soon, don't we? You know, thank you very much. So, yes. but it, this one is envisaging one or two years, I think. It's a good study. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining everybody. Well done, sir.